Welcome to the Living to 100 Club podcast. Here's our host, Dr. Joseph Cassiani. Well, hello to everyone joining us today on our podcast. You're listening to one of the public episodes this month on the Living to 100 Club program. And I'm your host, Joe Cassiani. Each week, our conversations educate and inspire, helping you get the best out of all the years we're given, regardless of what obstacles come our way. These public episodes air twice a month with our premium club membership, paying subscribers can listen to all episodes. So subscribers have access to two additional episodes per month. All episodes share educational and inspiring stories with practical tips and strategies for aging well. Premium episodes are for subscribers only. So be sure to sign up today at living200club.supercast.com. Today's program is about an innovative way to reduce alcohol use using an FDA-approved medication in an off-label way. Ryan Noonan is our guest, and he describes the Sinclair Method, now available in 35 states, using the medication naltroxone. This physician-prescribed medication is typically used to treat an alcohol use disorder during a period of abstinence. The approach that our guest describes, the Sinclair method, reduces the pleasurable or euphoric effects of drinking, but without the abstinence. First, a little background. Passionate about helping to control the alcohol epidemic, Brian earned his nurse practitioner degree from Vanderbilt University with specific training at the Vanderbilt Institute for Treatment of Addiction. For the last 15 years, Brian has helped thousands of patients to decrease their alcohol consumption using the Sinclair Method, as well as treating many other general psychiatry patients, including those with depression, anxiety, HDHD, and more. He now focuses on spreading the word about the Sinclair Method so that more people can break free from their negative alcohol use patterns. Brian, welcome to our podcast today. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here today. Great, great. Glad to have you with us. Looking forward to our conversation. I always like to open by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about the journey that brought you to where you are today. I mean, I covered some of the highlights, but maybe just uh, share what led you to the Sinclair Method. Well, actually, it sort of the first step on the path was by uh, circumstance, happenstance, I guess you could say. Uh, I was back at, uh, this is in 2000, I was at the University of Georgia studying uh, psychology, and they just happened to have openings for student psychology majors at a uh, an addiction treatment center. It was kind of what I think of now as kind of an old-fashioned kind of 30-day inpatient treatment, and I was what was called a residential counselor, which mostly involved kind of transporting people to and from AA meetings mm. and uh essentially just having a staff there. But that was kind of my first introduction to addiction. And I guess kind of subsequent to that, it being on my resume and kind of my first kind of semi-professional experience just kind of led me down to the path. So Mm -hmm. kind of each subsequent opportunity I had kind of built on that until it was uh, kind of what I ultimately ended up focusing on a decade later. But kind of in between or kind of, I guess, concurrently with some of that, Mm -hmm. I did have quite a significant experience of treating severe mental illness, which involved even working at state hospitals, uh, mm-hmm. Oregon State Hospital, including you know, schizophrenia and some other severe illnesses. And But I guess maybe the past five or six years, it's mostly been actually a uh, high functioning, kind of the opposite end of the mental health spectrum, uh, really kind of high functioning adults who have issues with depression or mm-hmm. anxiety, sleep, or kind of today's topic, they you know, kind of have drink in some kind of concerning uh, mm-hmm. uh, way. So so I've kind of worked the full gamut. Of, I used to teach at uh, you know, the faculty at uh, Seattle University uh, for, I guess that was three years. So kind of have a broad background, but really kind of, I think the most interesting kind of work I do and is the Sinclair Method. It really is something novel and it is you know, highly effective for most people. So it really is exciting to be kind of at the, the forefront of it, I think. Great. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll talk more about the Sinclair Method. But first, let me ask you about 
naltrexone. It's used in the traditional treatment for an alcohol use disorder, but that's that's different from the way you're approaching it. So what's the traditional approach? Yeah, that's right. You know, the naltrexone is uh, now a uh, generic and it was uh, FDA approved back in 1994, actually, for alcohol dependence and kind of kind of approved in the, the traditional way is that you would think of, which is to promote abstinence. Mm-hmm. So the kind of the original instructions that were part of the, the, you know, the FDA approval process and then kind of subsequent use of it were that you would essentially you know, take the medication daily, take the naltrexone daily, and then kind of essentially go as long as you could uh, without uh, drinking. And even kind of more than that, it was a requirement that you not have had alcohol seven days prior to the to the beginning of a treatment. So, mm-hmm. so you would have to abstain from alcohol for seven days, take the medication on a daily basis, and then go as long as you could without uh, drinking. And, uh, you know, all the measurements in terms of uh, outcomes for these the original uses were how long did it take for the person to relapse or how long mm-hmm. did you know, these types of these types of measurements. So marginal effectiveness, would you say, or? That's right. And in fact, in 2001, which was, I guess, uh, six, seven years after the uh, FDA approval, the largest study done on naltrexone, and uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, actually, was negative. I think there were about 200 people in that study. So a good size study, a random controlled trial. And uh, they concluded that the, you know, the, the study did not support the use uh, for naltrexone for chronic alcohol dependence. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of in tandem with just kind of the general consensus that it didn't work very well. You know, it was something that if you're in psychiatry and especially if you were in a, treating addictions, of course, you were aware of naltrexone. And, you know, it wasn't like you know, some off the radar type of thing, but it was just thought of as not really worth it in some sense. It might be kind of a last ditch effort or it just really was not used at all because it was thought of as as not being very effective. Mm -hmm. And the reason being that people couldn't abstain or what were some of the roadblocks to success? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, that's right. And so kind of even success, part of it was just kind of how they were thinking about what success was, you know, success being how long could you not drink? Mm -hmm. Uh, So what it's important to know about naltrexone is kind of how it works and that, and you can kind of think about, well, it's hard to kind of understand of how it would help in the first place using the traditional method. The medication itself is actually an opioid receptor blocker. So it blocks opioid receptors. So if a person were to take, let's say, heroin or morphine uh, or any type of opioid, then naltrexone blocks those receptors. So it would not work. So if you took, you know, let's say, just say morphine, you have a prescription for morphine, but you also took naltrexone with it there would be no effects uh, from the morphine because the naltrexone would be blocking those receptors. But what most people don't realize and what's really interesting about alcohol is that the reason we like it, the reason uh, for the buzz and why it's reinforcing is because it uh, releases endorphins, which are our uh, natural opioids, essentially. So if you take naltrexone, Prior to drinking, we'll say, for example, the naltrexone block the effects of alcohol, and which we'll we'll get into a little bit. But kind of so in advance of the Sinclair method, people were just taking naltrexone, not drinking. And so it's kind of not obvious why it would help very much. One of the theories for why it kind of had this marginal benefit in some of the early studies was that we do have sort of a, a, we can have these kind of endorphins released in response to, say, anticipation of drinking, or sometimes environmental cues can cause these kind of kind of you know, very uh, kind of low threshold uh, releases of the endorphins. And the idea was that, let's say, for example, you have alcohol dependence and you see a TV commercial about a beer or something like that, or you know, so there's some kind of some type of cue in your environment that this would cause some release and it's based on the association. And if you were taking naltrexone, it would block that from having some effect, which would then kind of further your uh, interest in, mm. in the alcohol. So, oh. mm. uh, and, and so that, that it had an anti-craving effect based on this idea. 
Yeah. But otherwise, it's kind of hard to kind of piece together kind of the theoretical basis for it, you know, that, mm-hmm. that, uh, that just blocking your opioid receptors on a daily basis, why that would make you less interested in drinking. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. As you described the release of the endorphins with just the commercial or thinking about the alcohol use, that sounds almost like a placebo effect where they're not actually taking in the substance, but it's the association, as you said, that's producing almost the same effect. Wow. That's right. It's like the, the association is there. So you're still getting this kind of chemical release. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I think the, the kind of that basic idea, there is some kind of, we actually see that kind of even in the process of doing the Sinclair method, we do have people report that kind of even in, in advance of drinking, there is that anticipation kind of like, let's say you're off of work and, and your mind is already kind of geared towards that first drink. It's kind of, as you get closer and closer to that first drink, the frequency of thoughts and mm-hmm. uh, related to it. Uh, and so you, you kind of have this priming in a sense. So, you, so, so there is some kind of endorphin re- release in advance of that. And so, so, there, so that makes sense, but you know, that's a very small effect and, and which is why you see that in practice, it doesn't work doesn't really have that big of effect. And, and, and as I mentioned, uh, mm-hmm. these subsequent studies have really been not really, uh, they've been negative studies. Uh, you sure. know, and, and of course, clinically, clinically, uh, providers had no confidence in it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, thanks for that explanation. That's helpful. So let's jump into the Sinclair method. You mentioned earlier, by the way, that you've had some recent publicity on, is it Good Morning America or... That's right. It, there was a, in the American Journal of Psychiatry, it was actually published, the original article was published in December of 22. And so I guess it took a little while for it to make the news cycle. But in February, uh, earlier this month, there was a story, a New York Times, and then kind of based on that, the Good Morning America picked up on it as well. So there was a, a kind of a, a video piece that was about two minutes on Good Morning America. And they don't actually call it uh, the Sinclair method. What they refer to it as was targeted dosing of naltrexone. And so they referenced the study. It was not quite, there were some elements of it that were not quite kind of the, it wasn't the full Sinclair method. Mm-hmm. I, it, it was kind of, it was kind of a component of it. So it was, it was very exciting because at least uh, the naltrexone and the as needed, the benefits of as needing dosing, as needed dosing were kind of publicized. So, so they talked about the study, which was a positive study where they gave uh, people the naltrexone and uh, if they were going to drink, they took the medicine and it decreased uh, the frequency of binging and it decreased the size of the binging episode. So, you know, there was some percentage reduction instead of, I don't know what exact numbers were, but instead of like six, we'll say there were the average bench, bench was four drinks instead of mm. six or something like that. So it had some positive, and they said the uh, benefits were uh, enduring as well, that up to six months they were seeing uh, these effects. So that was great. Uh, you know, they kind of didn't talk about the long term unlearning that takes place with repeated exposures, mm-hmm. uh, where that a person, whether they or just binge drinking or daily drinking, uh, they can really kind of reverse all interest in drinking over time. So it was kind of a limited application of it, mm-hmm. uh, but I still think it's exciting that it will trigger uh, some interest in naltrexone and uh, hopefully uh, kind of see that its potential lies in combining it with alcohol, that abstinence it, it simply won't work uh, mm-hmm. if you're not drinking. Yeah. Yeah, so a uh, very um, similar variation, maybe a variation of Sinclair method. But this journal, the American Journal of Psychiatry, did it mention Sinclair method or just as targeted? Yeah, yeah, it, it describes the Sinclair method, uh, oh. but does not mention does does not refer to it as uh, the Sinclair method. In part, it may have been because again, it was it was specifically about kind of binge drinking and, mm-hmm. and kind of, again, it was a, a component of what we think of as the Sinclair method, but not kind of the full, kind of the bigger application of it. So, so, so it was essentially it was the truth, but not the whole truth in the mm-hmm. sense that they kind of did, didn't realize that actually this is, has a broader application than what they were. So it was a very narrow, I'd say it was oh. a very just narrow, a, a true, but narrow, a narrow application mm-hmm. of, yeah. of, of the medicine. Okay. Uh, heavy binge drinking. That one slice of the alcohol use disorder. Yeah, but that's not the whole picture, of course. That's good. So it's considered an off-label approach. Can you help our listeners understand what what you mean by that? 
Yeah, you know, the F- it's interesting. The FDA, when you hear uh, something, and sometimes you'll just hear the phrase, a drug is approved, they'll drop the FDA. But what they're referring to is the Food and Drug Administration has a process of uh, approval. And I think it's really kind of a misleading term, and people probably don't quite know what it means or wh- what it doesn't mean. I think in most people's minds, uh, we have that phrase kind of conjures up the idea of maybe something like consumer reports where consumer reports you know, test all the toasters and then they, they decide that uh, you know, this, is a, this is the best value or this is the best one that uh, you know, has various features and then they give their recommendations or something like that. It's really, the FDA really is really a passive agency. It doesn't, it doesn't do its own testing, for example. Uh, the, the, the drug manufacturers do their own testing. So it's not that the FDA is testing all these medications for some particular benefit, and then after, uh, you know, subsequent to their testing, they are releasing their their approval for various drugs. The drug manufacturers submit the studies, but the studies are very. What they're seeking is is a very uh, specific indication. So, for example, a lot of times, what you'll hear on like television commercials, they'll say if you have you know, moderate to severe eczema, for example. Mm-hmm. So, what that means is, in the approval process, they did not they did not seek approval for mild cases of eczema. Mm -hmm. It just means they only sought this, or sometimes you'll see ages. It's FDA approved for 18 and up. So someone who was taking the medication, if they were 17, it would technically be uh, off-label. So the drug companies seek very narrow, very specific uses for these uh, medications, including the directions that that are part of it. So in the case of naltrexone, it was was FDA approved for alcohol dependence based on these uh, initial studies. But part of the studies or part of the kind of the indication was, you know, based on abstinence, mm-hmm. uh, must wait seven days and all these uh, these other factors. So it's really easy for a drug to be prescribed uh, off label. And sometimes people are kind of maybe concerned uh, by this, this label, but it really is not something to be uh, concerned by because, again, if they only saw indication for that specific problem, even if it is wildly helpful for mild eczema, it's not FDA approved for that, even though there might could be even be more helpful for mild eczema. Yeah, that's uh, but, a, but <laughs> yeah, that's a great great explanation. It, it's not that off label means it's harmful. It only means that off label is that age or that particular severity was not studied. It was not researched and it wasn't reported to the FDA. When it might be just yes. as effective with other ages or other uh, groups or whatever, but. It's just, uh, it's not that it's harmful at all. It's just like with the approval of naltrexone, it was uh, studied as a, you know, only with those who were following abstinence procedures. And it wasn't studied with partial abstinence or no abstinence as the Sinclair method does. That's what makes it off label. Yeah. That's that's correct. And off label, the other kind of, the other side of that is off label also doesn't mean not approved. You know, it's like the, mo- mostly the FDA is, is silent on different uh, mm. different things. So the fact that it doesn't have approval doesn't mean it has disapproval. It doesn't it doesn't mean that the FDA has you know, rendered a verdict on its mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, lack of uh, effectiveness. Mm. Uh, so the other thing, too, is and just kind of briefly, is that that once a drug, a drug has to have at least one FDA approved indication to be marketed. But. That doesn't mean, of course, it can't be prescribed for other things, but it at least has to have one indication, one FDA approved indication to even be kind of marketed and sold. But once it has that, then it can be used for various uh, other things. So oftentimes, you know, kind of part of the motivation for getting FDA approval for beyond just kind of the first entry into market is that if a drug is found to later be helpful for another indication, if it is either one uh, kind of determined that seeking that approval will not be profitable in some way. So it's, it's quite expensive, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to get F, to obtain FDA approval. So if this uh, process of seeking FDA approval for, say, a second indication, if that's not going to result in X number of sales or something like that, yeah. then it won't be sought. The other thing is once the medication is generic, then there's really no financial incentive whatsoever to seek FDA approval. So no matter how many studies or how widely prescribed it is and commonly prescribed for a given indication, it will still be officially off-label and not FDA approved. Uh, oh. point. So even though it might be very effective with other age groups or 
other populations, it's never studied, never reported, and never used in a lot of cases. That's right. Yeah. Wow. That's right. Yeah. Now, now it could be studied, but but the FDA, because the FDA is not an active mm -hmm. you know, agency in that regard, they're not. They're, they themselves aren't assimilating uh, mm -hmm. data and say, you know, based on twenty years of, uh, of of studies and widely prescribed use, this actually is uh, you know a good starting point for some treatment. It would it would just simply remain uh, off label. Mm -hmm. Well, so the abstinence is a, is a big problem with uh, traditional use of naltrexone. And you also mentioned when we spoke earlier that somebody is taking naltrexone daily or on a regular basis. And as soon as they stop, there's no resistance built up. There's no other benefit. There's no ongoing benefit. As long as, as soon as the drug is stopped, the person could resume abusive drinking. Is that right? That's right. It really, I mean, to the extent that it might help them once they stop taking it. Yeah, it's it doesn't really kind of do anything. You know, I, I would argue it doesn't really do much even while taking it. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, there there are certainly no lasting effects from mm -hmm. once it's discontinued. And essentially, kind of, it's in part because abstinence itself doesn't really is not really a treatment for alcohol uh, addiction. You know, one thing that AA says is that that is correct is that. You can go five years, 10 years, however long it is without drinking. But if you pick back up, you're going to pick up right back where you left off. Mm -hmm. And what that kind of demonstrates is uh, that uh, abstinence is not really a treatment. Uh, time without a drink does not really do anything about the underlying issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of the kind of the basic answer to your question, which is, you know, if you stop the naltrexone, you were absent the whole time. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're just uh, back in a similar place. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a hiatus, just a, a a break. So how does how do you apply the Sinclair method then? I mean, why does it work? Why is it more effective than this total abstinence picture? Yeah. So one of the things is that that it that it is an active treatment. You know, it actually uh, targets and, and changes the specific uh, issue. So the one way to think of naltrexone is as a buzz blocker. You know, it's like you t if you take the medication. It blocks these endorphins from being released when you drink. So you don't get the buzz. You don't get the good feeling, the reinforcement, uh, you know, the effect that you're looking for is essentially not there. And it really is kind of it's operant uh, conditioning, uh, something that many people just kind of learned uh, in Psycho 101 or just something. They're just, it's a basic learning model, which is that any behavior that is rewarded you're going to get more of that behavior. And uh, then uh, kind of the other side of that is any previously rewarded behavior. If you take away, away the reward, you're going to get less of that reward. So what happens is over time, you're drinking alcohol, you're engaging in the same behavior that you were before, but you're not getting this reward. So you drink, there's no buzz. You drink, there's no reinforcement. You drink, there's no buzz that you're getting. And so essentially you're unlearning, you're, un, you're, you're mm -hmm. kind of breaking that association mm -hmm. between the behavior of drinking and the reward of these endorphins. And because it actually reverses this neurological association, as you go forward, the brain actually is changing. The interest in drinking diminishes. The thoughts related to drinking decrease. It just becomes kind of a movement towards indifference as it relates to drinking. It's just not something you could drink, but you could also not drink. It's not something that is that doesn't occupy much space in your, in your brain mm -hmm. uh, because that association and that reward has been extinguished. Yeah. So how does that interact with the blood alcohol level and the intoxication? I'm assuming the BIL can still go up with more alcohol. You just don't get the pleasurable effects from it. That's right. And that's really an interesting effect because it's not alcohol is not a kind of a uniform substance. It doesn't have a single effect. So that's exactly right. The medication is not an alcohol blocker. It simply has this one very narrow, specific effect of blocking the buzz. So your blood alcohol level remains the same on a per drink basis. The impairments that alcohol can cause, uh, slurred speech, loss of balance, 
these types of things. So basically anything that can go wrong when you drink that might go wrong when you drink, those types of things could still occur. So you still have to be a responsible drinker. But what's interesting about it is people find that all these kind of impairments aren't really, they aren't that fun, you know, that, that it's, uh, these things are not good times, simply not being able to speak coherently. That's a great um, explanation. They're not the desired impairments, that intoxication, third speech, whatever. It's blocking a lot of the pleasure that comes from that drinking. Yeah. That, yeah. That's right. That one specific effect. And that's important because essentially that all the behavior, you know, the other kind of behaviors of drinking are, are still there. But this the, kind of the reinforcement that underlies the compulsion and the interest in drinking, that's the one so there's one variable that's different. You're not getting your brain and really, you know, so you're not getting that neurological reinforcement. And so you do this behavior and and we actually see a pretty immediate reduction in kind of this is kind of what the, the recent study picked up on. We actually see uh pretty quickly we see a reduction in the size of uh the drinking sessions. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, so, so let's say a person drinks every day and they have six drinks every day. Pretty quickly, we see that they start drinking four, you know, maybe the next month it's two or three, and you know, some, something like that, maybe 25, 30% reduction. So that's kind of the initial response where you just, in and of itself, you're not getting that. It's not a pleasurable experience. So, so naturally, you're just going to kind of lose interest in it. Mm. But then the next day, because you've had how many years or decades of drinking, of getting this reward, of course, the next day, your brain is still interested. You know, it's like your drink show would hit the spot after work. So you do that. So that underlying interest is what takes longer. And that's what eventually, eventually, if the person continues to drink without reward, continues to drink without reward, eventually that underlying interest, that is what will be extinguished. And that takes about four to six months. And that's kind of what these recent uh, reports have kind of not picked up on is that, yes, it can it can decrease the size of a session, a binging session or any session. But really, with sustained use, it will extinguish the uh, interest in drinking uh, mm -hmm. altogether. Wow. So how often? What's the dosage like? I mean, who prescribes it? When do you start? How long do you stay on it? What are some of the... Yeah. Well, so it's uh, yes, it is a, it does require a prescription. So whoever prescribes uh, normal things could be a physician, uh, psychiatrist, nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, uh, kind of uh, whoever would normal normally prescribe medications. A lot of primary care providers, you know, kind of family doctors, those types of things. That's kind of hit or miss in terms of how comfortable they will feel. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, we hear people say they just have no either they just have no idea about naltrexone. Or if they do know about it, they only know the FDA approved. It's kind of like the Sinclair method is is off their radar. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so but that's sort of true, though. I would say even kind of working your way down into specialties. I mean, it's not necessarily the case that all psychiatrists would be familiar with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you know, kind of even addiction people would not necessarily be, again, they would know of naltrexone and what it is and all these kind of things and promote abstinence. But at this stage, whether they would know uh, kind of how to use it the way that was established by Dr. Sinclair, it, it could be kind of a coin flip. But again, it's, it is it is giving some more publicity. It was on NBC News. I think the best story actually was a couple of years ago that really kind of picked up on the broad application of it was on NBC News. And you can you can Google a Sinclair method NBC News. And it was like a 10 piece story where they do talk about not just decreasing the size of the binges, but the sustained effect of mm. uh, uh, eventually extinguishing the whole entire interest uh, mm -hmm. together. So, but as far as the dosing goes, it's actually also quite simple. Of course, this is basically true for any med. You want to start at a low dose. Sure. So usually we would prescribe, tell people to take half a tablet for a couple of days. You definitely want to take it with food. What's interesting, I think a general point here is that most of the things that we think of as brain chemicals or neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine and also uh, opioids, we think of them as brain chemicals, but really most of the receptors in most of those chemicals are manufactured in our GI tract. Mm. So that's one of the reasons that all of these, you know, it's like antidepressants and anything that affects those receptors nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, these are very common side effects. It's also one of the reasons that this idea with probiotics and this kind of the, the brain gut connection, there really is something to that. I think a lot of times people are kind of suspicious of that because it is a new 
emerging field. And I'm certainly not supporting every claim that's ever been made about that. But but the basic idea that our neurotransmitters that we think of as you know, modulating our mood and, and all these other things, uh, they really are. Uh, their origins really are in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So the same is true uh, with naltrexone. We have most of our opioid receptors in our GI tract. So you definitely want to take plenty of food at the beginning, but most people are fine one way or the other. And so basically one tablet, there's, 50, there's only one strength of tablet made 50 milligrams and probably 95% of people are on that tablet. So, so the basic idea is that if you're going to drink, you take the medication at least one hour before your first drink, the drug has to be kind of in place. It has to be metabolized and kind of make its way to you know, the proper receptor before the alcohol gets there. So the instructions are at least one hour in advance of drinking, but it could be two, three, four. If you know you're going to be drinking later, you can take it at lunch or something like that. But uh, you take the medication before you drink, and uh, it blocks the buzz. And, and so you get the, you get a benefit very quickly. And then the more you do that, uh, you'll unwind the interest altogether. So it's kind of taken PRN as needed. If you're not going to drink, you don't take it. That's right. Yeah, it's kind of, there are a couple of ways to think about it. One is uh, for people who are lactose intolerant, they can't have dairy products. So you can just get what's called lactate, which is essentially just an, an enzyme that helps them uh, process uh, uh, dairy foods. So it's like people who are lactose intolerant, they don't take lactate unless they're going to have a bowl of ice cream or yogurt or, so, or whatever it is, something like that. So the other way that I think about it, too, is just kind of like a seatbelt in a car. It's like, are you going to drive today? Well, no. OK, probably not going to wear, well, I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. But but if I am going to drive, I'm always going to wear my seatbelt. And so that's kind of a common response that we give in terms of people want to know how long am I going to have to take this? And so the answer is you're going to have to take it essentially indefinitely prior to drinking. So if uh, you drink once a week, you'll take the medication once a week. If you drink once a month, you take the medication once a month. If you only drink on New Year's, then you only take the medication on, on New Year's. So it's sort of kind of, if you think of it like a seatbelt, something like that, it's as needed as needed dosing. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's great. Great information, Brian. Uh, does health insurance cover this medication? Yeah, it's it's FDA approved, so it's uh, you know it's covered by insurance. Kind of, I guess I would the only thing so it is, it's definitely covered just like any other drug. Every I mean it's a it's a normal standard drug that you would find at any national or any really any pharmacy. I don't think we've, I've ever ordered it and mm -hmm. they didn't carry it. The only I guess you know you definitely want to be concerned with when you use insurance. You want to be careful about some types of the implications of that in terms of say life insurance, for example, or who mm -hmm. might have access to this information. So that's uh, that's something to be aware of. A lot of times people don't want to use insurance mm -hmm. because of privacy issues. So that's something. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that that, it's hard for to really know kind of, I think the basic concern definitely is, 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 is reasonable. Like what, what's going to happen to my information in terms of what actually happens or, or, or kind of the size of that risk? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know, but, but that is one consideration. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's helpful. That's helpful. Thanks. So we're just about out of time. So um, let me ask you, what, what's the takeaway for our listeners here? What would you hope our audience remembers from this conversation? I think that, that there is an effective a treatment that allows you to drink socially. Most people don't want to be abstinent. This is an effective treatment if you want to work your way towards abstinence. But uh, drinking is a, is a normal behavior. It, it's, uh, you know, drinking is not a problem in and of itself. Problem drinking is a problem. So if you're, if you're drinking normally, uh, which is uh, something that you can do with the Sinclair method, so it's really kind of an optimal outcome. You can still go to sporting events and happy hours and be part of the, the social group. It's a normal part of our, uh, of our socializing kind of rituals. The other thing uh, is just that it doesn't require you to hit rock bottom. It doesn't require you to be on the verge of divorce or get a DUI or anything like that. If someone thinks they might have their drinking away, they're not happy with, I would ser seriously consider this. Uh, the bar kind of is very low. And in fact, I don't even require a diagnosis. Like you don't have to meet some formal diagnostic criteria. Mm -hmm. If you think you're drinking more or in a way that you're not happy with, just take this tablet uh, before you drink. And uh, it, it really is about 80% effective. Of course, nothing works for everyone, but it really sure. is. It's very, very likely to work for you and allow you to drink in a way that doesn't concern you, that you mm -hmm. think is appropriate for your social circumstance. And then the other thing is, 
on the days that you're not drinking, you're not micromanaging it. You're not, I'm only going to drink on Tuesday, Thursday. You know, it's mm. like, it's just not an issue. It's not something you yeah. think about. Mm. It's not something you have to regulate. It's just, uh, you can have a very matter of fact relationship with, with alcohol. Mm. Wow. That's great. Do you have prescribers then available at Sinclair? Or? Yes, Sinclair Method, SinclairMethod.org. We have a psychiatrist, a psychiatric nurse practitioners, and it's all via telehealth. So we have video appointments. You can sit in your living room. We have people sit in their cars. We have people out in hiking trails sometimes. You know, so mm-hmm. it's kind of wherever you might be, you can have your appointment. The nature of prescribing laws are such that you have to have a license wherever the patient is, right. which is okay. why we only, we only, we can only help 35 states because the provider can be, you know, in Australia or somewhere, but if the provider's only licensed in New York, then the patient has to be in New York. Yes. So most of our providers, I'm licensed in about 15 states. So I can help, I can serve about 15 states. And most of our prescribers, or at least I think five would be the fewest that at uh, least amount that any providers were starting. So we have about 35 states, but it actually makes up about 80 to 85% of the population because mm-hmm. we're mostly in the largest uh, states. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Well, SinclairMethod.org. Okay. Well, looks like we're out of time for today, Brian. Um, before I wrap up, I just want to remind our listeners to visit my website, living to 100club Sign up for my email list, download a free copy of my nine tips to make living longer enjoyable. You'll also see a con- an option to contact me with your questions and comments. I welcome your feedback. Finally, be sure to subscribe to this podcast series as a premium club member so you don't miss any episodes. Maybe the episode that could seriously affect your decisions, your outlook, or your actions. Sign up at living to 100 clubsupercast Dot com. Brian, thanks so much for being a guest on our show today. For those who might want to contact you, they can do that through your website, SinclairMethod.com. Yeah, yeah, SinclairMethod.org. And we have, you can either email, uh, we have the chat box, all the various uh, ways yeah. to, to reach out. To, to, I'll be happy to, to talk to anyone. Yeah, well, terrific. Thanks so much for being a guest on our program. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. Hope to see you next time. Hi, I'm Lori LeBay, and I wanted to tell you about Alzheimer's Speaks, which is another great podcast. You see, my own mother lived with dementia for 30 years, and I felt lost. Did you know every three seconds someone in the world is being diagnosed with dementia? Odds are it's going to hit your families, too. We want to help you connect to services, products, tools, research, and stories so you can be prepared. Please subscribe to Alzheimer's Speaks on your favorite podcast platform.